All right, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Richard Farb, who's an associate professor of imaging at the University of Toronto. I met Richard about six years ago or so. He came down here, and uh, he's really, I believe, the only uh, neuroradiologist in Canada, I think. Um, thank you very much, Wouter, and it's nice to be back here. I was here six years ago, uh, and I owe a debt of gratitude to uh, Dr. Shivank and Marcel Maya and Frank Moser, uh, who uh, were very uh, generous and welcoming to me when I wanted to come down here and see how they actually did this. Uh, I got into this kind of through other, uh, other uh, publications that I had had and other areas of interest in disordered intracranial pressure. I became a uh, so-called expert in that, and I didn't even know it in, in, in SIH. So six years ago, I decided to come down here and see from the people who knew what they were doing how to do this, and uh, it was very helpful. I also visited Duke as well, and uh, Linda Gray, I think, is, uh, is here or maybe in the other room. Um, and again, she, uh, she showed me and opened my eyes to some things that uh, have really helped. So today I'm going to present to you and show you uh, our, um, sorry, let's see if this works. I have no disclosures. I'm going to show you how we do it in, in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, this is uh, the JDMI, so I'm from the Joint Department of Medical Imaging, which is about 90 radiologists. It's at the University of Toronto, which includes a lot of these hospitals as well as other ones. We're all one big department, and most of the neuroradiology takes place over here at Toronto Western Hospital. Uh, everything I'm going to talk about today is in uh, this publication, which was uh, recently published in, uh, I think it was April of uh, 2019. I'm not that good with social media, but one of my co-authors, Patty Nicholson, let me know that this actually was the most read and most downloaded paper for all of 2019 from the AJNR. So I'm not doing that to boast. I, th I really think that it's, it's a decent paper. But uh, what's impressive is that obviously people need help with this. And I think uh, having a systematic approach like we've outlined isn't the only way to do it. Every, there's a lot of experts in this room that have their way of doing it. But it actually put out there a way to think about it and, and, and how to approach it, at least in 2019. And I think we're moving beyond that. Um, I want to acknowledge my, uh, my co-authors. Uh, Patty Nicholson, who helped me with it. Uh, Phil Peng, who's presented here, I think, last year as an anesthesiologist, along with uh, uh, Dr. Lay, who sent me a lot of my patients. Uh, Dr. Massacott's a neurosurgeon who's recently come on board and helped us uh, treat these patients. Timo Krings and Carl Terberg are neuroradiologists who've also supported our work. So I'm going to show you our approach, which is basically uh, the patients first come to us with an MR of the head, an MR of the spine. We do complete MR of the spine. They eventually go on to some form of dynamic myelography, as Peter Kranz has told you. Um, a lot of these patients have already come with epidural blood patching. If they haven't, they get an epidural blood patch before the dynamic myelogram. The uh, radionuclide cystinography, the intrathecal injection of uh, gadolinium and conventional myelography really hasn't helped us at all, and you've heard other, other uh, speakers tell you that. Um, our approach is kind of pared down because I want to do head MR and spine MR at the same time one sitting. We do sagittal T1, axial really good flare. We do an imaging T1 of the entire spine. We do the T1 and T2 high-resolution space imaging, or just high-resolution T2 imaging, and we're looking for spinal longitudinal collections. We don't give gadolinium, and I'll, show, I'll explain that later. Uh, so the cranial findings were first described by uh, Fishman and uh, Bill Dillon, who uh, review all, all of these with, uh, with you. Back in 1993, they described the, most of these findings. Uh, I like the venous distension sign and the pituitary enlargement. Those are really helpful. Um, in the spine, this is what we're looking for, the spinal longitudinal extradural collection, which other speakers have shown you. I'm sorry if I'm repeating it, but I didn't get to see what a lot of other people actually presented in here. But this is what we're looking for, this black line that you can see in the epidural space here. There's CSF on both sides of it. Here it is an axial view. It's an extradural collection. T1 we do just to help me decide whether I'm looking at fat or fluid rather than fat saturating it, which kind of decreases it and makes the scan longer. So here's a typical patient, 50-year-old female, obviously has positive findings with the uh, subdural hygromas as well. She is SLEC positive. So if she's SLEC positive, we now know that that means I'm going to find her leak probably in the ventral aspect of the canal. And I do a digital subtraction myelogram with her prone head up here, feet down here. She's laying on her tummy, and this is 
the, in, the contrast that's starting to come up from the injection, which is down here off screen. I only do one plane of imaging. It's a shoot through lateral, to whether I'm going to do it prone or, or decubitus. I don't use that other plane for two reasons. Uh, our, I do this only on the neuroangio table. We have two neuroangio suites. They're identical. One, one Im image intensifier is somewhat large. The second Im image intensifier is tiny. I can't bring them both in with a table tilt, so I only bring in one. Patients are not done with uh, general anesthetic anymore. Uh, I just find it so much easier to do it with one plane, and it's the one plane that matters. It's the money view, if you will. And, uh, and the, uh, the radiation is considerably less. It's half. So I have not spent so much in radiation currency. So this is that 50-year-old lady. You've seen many images of this uh, just uh, recently. Peter showed you typical appearance of the double, the double pant sign or what, you know, both, both, both legs fill out instead of just one all the way down. And that's where the hole is. So that we've called the type 1. Our classification system is very similar to Wooter's. Uh, it uh, is even more simplified for me because I want to be able to think of this very simply and classify people and move, move into the next, uh, you know, move along in our imaging chain. Uh, this is that patient. This is that drawing that uh, is from our paper. This was done by Wendy Gu, our medical illustrator, and it's really helpful. It shows basically what you've seen in other papers, that there's a small spur or degenerative disc that has grabbed that dura and rented a hole in it, either by having a small calcified spur or actually grabbing the dura and tearing it when patients cough or lift or, or uh, sneeze. And here's that typical appearance of the spur. <coughs> this is another patient, 28-year-old female, uh, who also uh, has positive imaging findings on the brain. And in the, uh, in the interest of uh, saving gadolinium, we don't inject these patients with gadolinium anymore, and this is why. When we do our protocol, which doesn't include gadolinium, we have always found uh, these small little uh, areas of, of dural thickening, this pachymeningeal thickening, we can see it on flare just as well as we see it with gadolinium. Every time I've seen it, we've seen it here and vice versa. So it means we can image these patients at night, the scan is a lot faster, there's no injection, and uh, we get the head and the spine done at the same sitting. So her spine showed obvious longitudinal collections, and you see them here uh, on axial view. Again, whether this collection is cervical, ventral, dorsal, lateral, it doesn't matter. You won't be able to localize it until you do the, uh, the dynamic study. So this is a patient who we put prone, as according to our protocol. And on the prone myelogram, uh, you would see a little bit of leakage, and it looks like it's actually out here posterior lateral. So I said, OK, we'll, do, we'll turn her lateral and see it better. And we do this, and we uh, see it a little better in the, uh, the lateral projection. And this is a typical appearance of, um, of the loculation and the collections of this contrast getting into the epidural space and then eventually going out uh, free, flying within the epidural space, and it goes up and down the canal like that. Um, they all look very similar, all of these people. Peter Kranz just showed you a great example of it and how it looks uh, when you have a big one. Uh, they all look very similar. They're not, I don't think these are lateral diverticula. I think they're just tears and loculations and eventually find its way into the epidural space. Uh, Dr. DeBrocki and Dr. Beck, uh, beautiful pictures of this in their radiology article. CT and, and uh, Peter Kranz just showed you some very nice images. Again, on CT, it's the same lesion. And I've called these lesions uh, type 2 because I think they're just getting out here over the axilla or maybe it's, maybe it's not the axilla, maybe it's the shoulder of the root sleeve. It gets out and it loculates, and it's still inside the spinal canal, so that's why you get that spinal longitudinal collection, which we just call a SLEC now. So what about the variation in that? And, you know, not everybody who has a SLEC is head positive. So this is a patient who's head negative, completely normal imaging of the head, and this is why you have to do the spine, because they are going to have this SLEC. A lot of patients, actually in our statistics, it's about 30% of patients who are SLEC positive are head negative. So you have to do the spine. And the thing about this, these select positive patients is I think you can, you can pretty much find all of them. Uh, this is uh, a patient who uh, was brain negative, select positive, and this is that small little leak coming out here. So 
So we take these patients who are SLEC positive and uh, we'll try again a very localized blood patch at the right level and we have some success with it. I really think this is uh, operator dependent as uh, you've heard from other speakers. There's, uh, you have to be, um, you have to at least be di uh, directed with your epidural blood patch to have a chance to have that uh, be successful. But I think we can be sig significantly successful with blood patching of these SLEC positive patients, whether they're type one or type two. Moving on, this is going to be another type of patient. This is again positive with that little bit of epi or that little bit of subdural thickening, and uh, she's got brain sag, so she's brain positive, but she's SLEC negative. And this woman uh, was uh, was a woman that I saw shortly after coming down here to Cedar Sinai and learning how to do general anesthetic biplane digital subtraction myelography, and. Uh, you can see it's negative. This is a small little diverticulum. Nice technique and negative. But while I was here at Cedar sinai Dr. Shavink and Marcel showed me their example, their first example, because they were the first ones to identify this, which is a CSF to venous fistula. And they subsequently reported it. This is their picture from their report. And I looked at that and I thought, why aren't you doing this laterally? And so I went back and went back and took that same patient and repeated it just laterally, and sure enough, there was her fistula. So that's why when Wooter sent me the email and said, I noticed you're doing them lateral. It's like, well, that's why I did it, because uh, I found hers. And then I went on and took all my patients. Sorry, you can see this one. This is a video that should show you the little squiggle here. I know you've seen these, but we'll, we'll run through it. It's a little squiggle, and it eventually comes down to here and squiggles away. So I think what's happening with these people is that it's not really a diverticulum. I think it's a pseudomeningocele that busts out and, and basically just hangs around that nerve root and eventually will find its way into a lymphatic or a venous channel and will be carried off. And that's why we see these pouches and all these different things. This one doesn't have much of a pouch, and this one has no pouch. It just almost found its way directly into that vascular space. And then uh, our type 4 is, uh, this is an example of that. This is a 56-year-old gentleman, a variety store worker, who has bi large bilateral subdural uh, collections, but he also has a positive venous distension sign. And that's your first clue, the best clue, that he's actually got the subdurals because he's got intracranial hypotension. Despite that, we couldn't interfere enough, and he ended up getting, uh, getting some surgery. Uh, then we eventually got the patient, proved that he was uh, SLEC negative, and we did him in the decubitus position showing that we have extravasation coming off of a, a uh, I think this is a C8 root, and it's coming off and going out further lateral because it's beyond the spinal canal. He doesn't present with spinal longitudinal collections. He's SLEC negative. Uh, maybe this is actually, if I would have given this a couple more days or weeks, it would have developed that pseudo meningocele and then eventually gone into a vein and been a, a type 3 or CSF fistula. Maybe that's how these things are evolved. This is my only case of a type 4, but it was uh, dramatic. Uh, he was repaired and did quite well. So in review of our numbers now, this is a little updated since our paper came out. Um, we have select positives and select negatives that we've kept in this kind of this prospective mechanism, a prospective uh, strategy of working these people up. And it dichotomizes these people. You, deciding whether they're select positive or select negative dichotomizes for me so I can actually then decide how to move on with them. And if they're select positive, the slight of the leak will be seen in 96% of these people. In my hands, that's our experience. And there's one missing here, which is great. I'm really glad to have followed Peter Kranz's talk because I'm sending him that one patient. That, <laughs> that is, where's Peter? Is he still here? Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Peter. I always follow you, and it's great. It makes it easier on me. But I think you're right. I think you're 100% right. This, this, this is a, a young woman. The one that I'm missing on the select positive patients is a young woman who uh, I've done three myelograms on, and I can't find it. And I'm going to stop because I've given her enough radiation. Our CT scanners are over 10 years old, and you have beautiful pictures. So I'm going to send her, I'm going to send you this patient. Hopefully next year we'll see my pictures and then your pictures. I'll be the before, you'll be the after. I'm saying elsewhere, but that's good, really. And that will bring us to 100%, so I'm really hoping for that. Um, this is also a pitch for you to do her before, like, next year, too. Um, <laughs> And the patients, uh, patients uh, all have a dural type of mechanical tear, either that type 1 or type 2. 
Uh, 78% of them were found dur uh, ventrally on the dura, and in our numbers, uh, we found 22 laterally, 22%. What, what about, uh, sorry, that gives us 80% uh, being evident in the prone position of these type 1s and type 2s. So that's why I start prone. It's really going to give me the best yield. If they're select negative, uh, the site of the leak was identified in 67% in my numbers. Not, you know, I'm missing 30% of these people. Uh, they're never ventral. They don't respond well to epidural blood patching. Maybe we could do a better job of it. Um, I tried uh, epidural patching with fibrin in a lot of these patients. There's been some success with them, but generally, uh, uh, you know, largely, they fail eventually and they go on to surgery. But I'm certainly willing to learn a better technique. Um, I, they're, they're all, uh, or not all, but most of them are going to be CSF to venous fistulas. There was one case that was just extravasating into the uh, perispinal region. And I start with lateral decubitus in all these patients. Again, despite that, 33% of them, I couldn't find their leak. Um, so before I get on to why and what I think we can do about it, I just want to say that, again, we, I divide these patients now into the two types. And uh, sorry into two types, and it really helps me discuss with the patients when I first meet the patients that, okay, you're select positive, I'm going to basically find your leak. It might take me three milligrams, but I will find your leak. If you're select negative, I tell them, I might find your leak. I got a good chance of finding your leak, and, uh, and it really helps in, in, in stratify the patients and stratify the way I'm, I'm going to approach them. Uh, so what do we do with these people? Uh, brain positive, select negative, and a DSM negative. I've done the full battery of DSMs and they're negative. That's 33% of one side or what is it, uh, almost 20% of the cases that, I, that are presenting to me. And again, again, it's good to follow Peter Kranz because like, well, why, what can I do to help that? So first, maybe I've got to consider the fact that I just missed it. And this is one of those patients that maybe that, that's the case. Was it, was, this was a patient who uh, had lateral decubitus myelography. And I came back to it looking at it wondering, gee, you know, I spent a half an hour looking at him after the case, and I couldn't really see a fistula or a leak. Maybe it was up here. Was there something here? Was it down here? I magnify the images and look at it, and then in following it again and going back and looking at it later on, I noticed there was this one little dot here. And I thought, okay, I'm going to bring the patient back and see, maybe I'll repeat it. Maybe, maybe I missed something. And sure enough, that, there's that dot. But also right beside it is a very large CSF to venous fistula. So why does that happen? I think Peter gave us a great idea, and I think he should hurry up and publish that, of doing this with an inspiration. What's the natural history of these CSF to venous fistulas? Are they going to close and open up on their own? Do they wax and wane? Do they heal on their own? And when am I imaging it? Am I imaging it at the opportune time? Um, this is a patient. This is a patient that had. In 2018, in January, it was positive, had the, uh, the thickened dura, and had uh, positive venous distension sign, a bit of a big pituitary. She was SLEC negative, so I'm getting ready to do a myelogram on her. And she said, you know what, I'm not that bad, I'm going to wait. Maybe, uh, maybe you can image me later on. So sure enough, she goes back and sees her neurologist two years later. She says, I'm feeling better. The neurologist says, well, let's see if you're still leaking. And she really, all the symptoms, her symptoms had disappeared, and her MR imaging got better, so she normalized. So I think without doing anything, this disease waxes and it wanes. So how can I image this and improve it? How can I improve the flow, increase the flow in those fistulas to try to see them? Because I think that's what we're missing, is that 30% are still going to be fistulas. And Peter told us, well, maybe you should consider these things. Valsalva was fascinating, Peter. It's actually not going to help us. It's going to reverse it. It's going to, it's going to impede us from finding it and uh, doing it during inspiration. Uh, is inspirational. Um, pre how about, how about pre-DSM maneuvers? Uh, should we have them get up and exercise and uh, lift things and uh, run around the department before we put them on the table and do their DSM? It's worth thinking about. Maybe we should do that before MR to make sure that they show us some findings. Uh, intrathecal pressurization, maybe, and we monitor that while we're doing our myelograms. So there's things to think about to get me that extra 30% that I know we're not finding. So that's uh, something to think about moving forward. Walid Brinjikshi, a lot of you know, he was our fellow at um, 
in Toronto in uh, neurointervention, neuroradiology. And uh, he went back to uh, Mayo Clinic, and he's been very active in social media, something that our, my, another fellow, Patty, tries to keep me up, with, keep me up to speed on. Um, but he published this on, uh, on Twitter, and uh, I'm showing this with his permission but because it's a great case. This is an example of a patient that, again, did I just miss it or not? You have to image the entire spinal axis. This is somebody that they saw something funny on a, uh, si on, in a sacral region on a prior lateral decubitus myelogram. And, and here you can see the, uh, the needle is up at the L434 level. So I'm going to show you his video, if it works. Some of you have already seen this, no doubt, on Twitter. And sure enough, this is a small venous fistula, CSF to venous fistula, and it's coming off way down here at the bottom of the sacral sac. And you can see it's actually draining into two small veins over here. So he went ahead and did a CT scan of it. Sorry. And that's actually the venous structure on CT that's filling with the contrast. So, yeah, um, it's tough. If you've only got a small intensifier, you're going to have to do a lot of different injections. Remember, we only get one good shot each time we inject, uh, in, inject Omnipec, so it makes it a little tougher. So in review, if there's select positive, head positive, or just plain select positive, head negative, we're going to treat them the same way and have the same approach. They're either type 1 or type 2. Patching usually helps to some, in some of them. Uh, we're going to do them prone, and I will identify after Peter shows us that, uh, that case next year, I'm going to, we're going to be able to do 100% of those. In patients who are head positive but select negative, uh, we've talked about those, and yeah, I only get about 67% of those in our numbers. This is really the interesting thing. What about your head negative, spine negative? What do we do with those people? That's a large population of people with headaches. Inside that population, there's probably some leakers. Um, like Peter says, not all imaging is good imaging. Should we re-image everybody at one of our centers? Um, I don't know what to do with these people. So it really does beg the question, though, uh, what's the best test to determine who should go on to an extensive and intensive DS myel uh, digital subtraction myelography or, or CT myelography, whichever? Um, I don't have an answer for that, but really I think we're getting close to, uh, to being able to do much better than we have. And it's, again, that small segment of those 33 percenters that we have to do a little better with. So thanks very much. I'm going to stop there.